Now I'm reading, and I would ask you to stand with me, if you would, as we respect God's Word from Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 9. Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third this when they also wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this reading of your precious, inerrant word. We uh, are grateful that you have entrusted to us your communication to help us know you and come to you. For whatever reason, you want us to come by faith, and so everything is not so clearly spelled out that it's automatic. But, Father, we are grateful for what you have given us. Pray today that you will enlighten our hearts as we look at this word and study it in a little more detail. We also pray, Father, for those who are suffering, who are sick. I, I, I don't think in the eight and a half years we've been here, we've ever had so many people facing very serious illnesses and debilitating sicknesses as we do now. So many people who have suffered the loss of loved ones and are experiencing that grief just seems like uh, it's been one after another for the last few months. And so I want to lift all of those up today and pray that you will bring healing, that you will bring your comfort. And Father, uh, um, as important as the physical healing is, thinking also of this one we just heard about this morning, facing a cancer diagnosis and financial difficulties, and I lift them up and pray for them. But Father, as important as all of these are, our spiritual well-being is even more important. So would you please help us to see from your word today the truth that we need for ourselves and the truth that we need for our loved ones and friends who do not know you. We'll pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and uh, would you please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 20. So we continue our journey through this wonderful book. I hope you're enjoying getting to know Jesus better. What a wonderful privilege we have to do that. I'm, I'm convinced that most people who talk about Jesus um, don't like to come to church, but they love Jesus, don't really know Jesus. They uh, know a figment of who they think he is because of something they heard in Sunday school when they were kids, but... We're seeing a different Jesus, aren't we? One who is strong, one who is clear, one who is loving, and yet at the same time, very clear in the consequences of unbelief. And so we need to pay attention, and here is one more opportunity for that in this parable that Jesus gives. Mugger jumped out in front of a very well-dressed man walking down the street in Washington, D.C. one night pulled out a gun and threatened him, said, give me your money. And the man looked at him indignantly and said, you can't do that. I'm a U.S. senator. 
And the guy said, well, in that case, give me my money. Uh, it's a question of ownership, right? And that's what this parable is all about. Now, it's, it's not often that we hear someone just come right out and say, I hate God. I, I can't remember a time when I heard somebody say that outright and really mean it. But do you realize that outside of Christ... We all hate God. We do. It's our natural state. We repress the hatred and we cover it over. Uh, usually, we get around it by becoming kind of indifferent about God or begin to believe or accept that he's irrelevant because the, part, the reason we hate God is because of the accountability issue. If there really is a God and we really are accountable, we're not very happy about it. And that's why Paul says in Romans 8, 4, that the natural mind is set on the flesh, which is self. And it's at enmity with God. It's at war with God. It hates God. Because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot in and of itself. So this is the battle that rages. It's the battle between self and God. And in one way of looking at it, it's a battle of ownership. The natural mind is at war with God. The natural mind wants its own way. We intuitively know that God owns us by right of creation, right? But we want to own us, and so we hate him. And we hate the claims that he makes on our life. We know we owe him, but we want what we want. And so we try and come up with ways to not be totally offensive to him if he does exist, but basically have declared him irrelevant. I think if that thought makes you uncomfortable this morning, beloved, there's a possibility that you don't really know Christ. That you don't know God. Because to know him is to come eventually to love him and to love his ownership in your life rather than to, rather than to try and hold him off. Now this parable relates specifically to Israel. And we'll see that as we go through it. But the application is, I think, scary relevant to every life. You know, the vineyard owner is the hero here, but he's an absent owner. And because he's absent, it becomes easy for the tenants to think, to, to become indifferent toward him, to treat him as though he didn't matter. And the most foolish thing they could possibly do is to treat him as though he doesn't matter. But that's what we do with God, and that's what these tenants are doing, leading step by step to their own destruction. So I want us to see the steps that kind of get him I get them from this point of being assigned this task to the point of destroying themselves because they refuse to pay attention to who he is and to acknowledge him for who he is. So the first thing I see here is God's present, or his gift, if you will, prostituted. God's present prostituted. Absentee owners were well known in the time of Christ. It was, it was not uncommon for a man to live far away from where some of his property was, and he would give it over to the authority and to the care of someone who would, who would manage it for him. It was a common thing. And so the symbolism that's used here would have been obvious to Jesus' audience. The owner, the vineyard owner, is God. The vineyard itself is Israel. Israel is all over the Old Testament identified and symbolized by a vineyard, just as in the passage that Sharon read for us this morning in Isaiah 5. It's there in Jeremiah 2. It's there in Psalm 80. It's there in the Song of Solomon. It's, it's all over the Old Testament. Israel, as the vineyard, the temple where Jesus was standing, had a huge door that led into the Holy of Holies, 100 feet high, this great temple that Herod had built, and there was a rich carving of a vineyard that went all the way up and around that doorway representing Israel. So the vineyard is Israel. The owner's absence represents the fact that God is not physically present 
with Israel, or with us for that matter, and the tenants are clearly the leaders, the religious leaders who are acting on behalf of the owner. So they are these scribes, Pharisees, the religious elite that we saw coming to challenge Jesus last week. But now we get into a problem because the owner decides it's time to take some profits. And so he sends a servant to, to collect his fruit. But the servant is not well respected or received. And so in the middle of verse 10, we find the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. What's happening? What's happening is that the tenants are beginning to act like owners. Right? They've gotten greedy. They've decided in the absence of the owner to come and to tell them what to do that instead of doing what they should be doing, they will treat themselves as owners and, the, and, they, and they don't respect the servant that he sends. Now, the vineyard is still belongs to the owner, right? The owner is the one who has put up the money and taken the risk to get this vineyard started. He's the one who, has, uh, who owns it. He's the one who has taken all the risk. He's the one who has made the investment. The tenants are hired laborers. They will be paid if they do their job. But somehow it's become easy for them in the absence of the owner to begin to take on thoughts that go beyond what they, where they should be going. The profits should be his, even though they would be paid. But in his absence, they have developed an attitude of independence, an attitude of indifference toward this absentee owner. And so his request is seen as an intrusion. You know, it doesn't take long for independence and indifference to turn into hatred when accountability is finally asked for, as is happening here in this passage. And so the tenants beat the owner's representative and send him packing. They are acting like owners. Now this represents the attitude of the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders and the priests and what they were doing in Israel. They were claiming to be God's representatives, to represent God to the people. This was their function. But they had so defiled the law of God by this time with their own additions to and with their own interpretations of it that Judaism, the kind of the religion that had grown up around their oral traditions, Judaism wasn't God's, it was theirs. It really didn't look a whole lot like what God had originally given them. And so this parable is aimed at them as those who should be representing God, but who in fact have taken on ownership responsibilities and are saying this is the way it is instead of the way that God had originally said. They are acting like owners and they are pr prostituting in the process the gift that God had given. But you know, there's a broader application here than just, <clears throat> than just the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Israel. By application, Jesus is saying to every one of us who are here this morning, look at your life. Where did you get it? It's a gift from God. You have abilities, you have intelligence, you have possessions, you have ambition, you have creativity, you have opportunity. You have jobs, you have health. Where did it all come from? It's all gifts from God, right? It all came from God. And yet we have the possibility of prostituting the gifts that God's given us just like these people were. You know, Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, he says, what do you think you have that you did not receive? And the answer, of course, is nothing. You don't have anything that you didn't receive. I don't have anything that I didn't receive. And the obvious implication is then that we have received a life from God with an expectation of return. We're not, beloved, owners. We're stewards of what God has given us. But we quickly become like the tenants in this parable, right? It's really easy for us to begin to think, well, this life is my own. I'll do with it what I want. And so we insist on having our own way. And when we do that, we're acting like owners instead of like tenants.
tenants. We've been given a mind, but the Lord has something to say about what we sh- how we should use that mind and how we should, what kind of things we should be thinking and what we should do with it. Philippians 4.8. God has given us the ability to have ambition, but he kind of makes the boundaries within which it should, it should occupy itself. He's given us sexuality, but he establishes the boundaries for that. He's given us the ability to make money, but he helps us understand what we should do with it if we are being faithful. And instead, we take all of these things and we begin to manage them as though they really, truly belong to us alone. They're on loan, beloved. They're not ours. This world is filled with ways to tell you, though, that you are your own. You know, I don't know how many self-help books and uh, seminars, perhaps, in in the business world. It seemed like every year there was another power seminar that we had to go to and attend. But I, what I noticed over time, in fact, I just, I just saw, a, I, I, I thought he was gone by now, but I saw an advertisement in the paper just this week for Tony Robbins. Apparently he's still around. He's still the ultimate business guru. And, and all of these things will tell you this. They will tell you that you are in charge of you. They will encourage you to look to the inside of you to find out what you need to do your life, but it's all about your values, your agenda, how you can get to the top. It's all telling you you are the owner. It all subscribes to the same philosophy that, you know, Elvis and Frank sang about, right? This life is my life. I did it my way. Really? You know, the ultimate demonstration that we are not our own is we don't get to name the time we're going to die, do we? We didn't get to name the time we were going to be born, and we don't get to name the time we're going to die. We're not in charge of anything. We just think we are. But when we begin to live as though we were owners, beloved, we're prostituting the gifts that God has given us. We act like God is long ago and far away as we begin to advance our own cause use the gifts that he's given us to do what we think is right, to fulfill all of our dreams, to provide for our security. God may seem long ago and far away, but God is right here and right now, and he is paying attention. We're not our own. In fact, as believers, he tells us we're bought with a price, but even apart from Christ, we are not our own. God is the owner. He's given us a life, and we are to live it for him. Instead, we act like owners, prostituting the gift of, his great, of this great life that he's given us. And the idea of being accountable until we can come to faith in Christ and realize how much better it's going to be to submit to him than not, until that time, the idea of accountability brings hatred. So we have God's present that gets prostituted. Secondly, God's patience is perverted by these people. God's patience is perverted. After they send away the first servant, the parable really takes a dramatic turn. You know, as you read through it, you kind of have to stop and think as you go because, because you just read past some of the most dramatic parts. But one of them would be when that first servant is, is beaten and then he's sent away. Jesus' audience would have expected what? Well, they would have expected retribution, right? This owner will now surely with this servant coming back, having been beaten and returning no fruit of the labor of these people, no return as investment, no, no fruit coming back, he will surely fall upon them with swift retribution. Anybody would think that's what's going to happen. Call the cops. Get them out of here. Replace them with someone who will be faithful. But that's not what happens. The opposite happens. Verse 11, he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away up empty-handed. And he sent a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. What what is this? What's going on here? This, beloved, is one more indication of God's almost infinite patience. Almost infinite. This is an indication of God time after time after time putting up with our rebellion, 
and with our declaration of independence and saying, here's another chance. This is God being patient beyond anything that any human being would ever be. This is the love of God being demonstrated. This is the action of the God who is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's what this is. Giving chance after chance to get it right. Well, who are these messengers that are being sent? Well, from Israel's perspective, these are the prophets that God kept sending, right? Later on in Acts chapter 7, a few years after Jesus' time, Stephen, one of the early leaders in the church, is the first martyr of the church. But he preaches this great sermon against the leaders in Israel at that time who were about to kill him. And he says this, this is in Acts 7 verse 51, he says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, I mean, if they got their... These guys have the right to kill you, right? And Stephen is talking like this. I would find a way to be more diplomatic, I'm sure. But he was a brave man. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your, did your fathers not persecute? He was right, right? They drove Elijah into the wilderness. They put Jeremiah in a pit. They sawed Isaiah in half. They stoned Zechariah to death in front of the altar. After 400 years of silence, God sent John the Baptist, a new prophet, right? And John arrived on the scene. Pharisees hated him because they hated God. You say, they didn't hate God. The Pharisees were, the Pharisees were doing everything they can to obey the law of God. The Pharisees were, you know, they, they wanted to please God. The Pharisees were the back to the Bible group of their time. The Pharisees didn't hate God, but beloved, don't you see that's the very reason they hated God. They hated God because they didn't understand mercy and they didn't understand grace. They hated God because they thought the law was there and that's what they had to keep. And because they couldn't keep it, they made up their own rules and their own version, a version that they could keep. And then they couldn't keep that and they hated the whole thing. So every day of their life, they're getting up and going through the motions of trying to keep something that they can't keep and they hated it. And they hated the God who imposed this on them. They never got past law to grace. And when messengers arrived on the scene saying, listen, it's not about compliance. It's about cleansing. It's not about performance. It's about repentance. It's, it's not about your perfection. It's about the perfection of the Lamb who's going to come. They killed them. You know, once the blinders are off, because the Bible teaches that without Christ, we are all blind to spiritual things. Once the blinders are off, it's hard to imagine how anybody could hate grace. But that's the reaction of most of the world. Trying to go their own way, trying to do their own thing, trying to placate God in some way and hating Him all at the same time because they will not accept His grace. Could we also hate grace and kill his messengers? I think so. J.C. Ryle, old Puritan writer, he says this of the rebellious human nature. He says, if we could pull God down from his throne, we would. I think that's true. If we could pull God down from his throne, we would. Until we understand grace, we would. Once we understand grace, we can worship him with an open heart and with true love. But until then, we're worried about how am I going to please this thing that's unpleasable? We understand grace. The gospel is so simple a child can understand it, and yet those who hate God and pervert the message can't get it. And so they pervert God's patience as time after time after time, messenger after messenger. He said, so who are the messengers in our life? The messengers in our life could be a pastor who preaches the Word of God, right? 
And we hear it, we hear it, we hear it, and we turn away. The messenger could be a parent. The messenger could be friends. And the messenger could be a campus ministry like crew that we've heard about the last couple of weeks. The messenger could be some stranger that God has sent into our life to to reveal to us something about the Word of God. The, the messenger, messenger can be the Bible itself, but we have beaten them all. We've sent them off, empty-handed, trading a few years of play owner because if we can only play owner. We can never be the owner. Realize that, right? We trade a few years of playing owner for an eternity of separation from God. What foolishness. We want our ambition more than we want Him. We want our empty pleasures more than Him. We want our sexuality more than Him. God is saying through His messengers, would you please give me the steering wheel? And we kill the messenger and, and press down on the accelerator. Edmund Clowney says this. He says, people ask about this absentee owner. People ask. If God exists, why doesn't he prove it? Why doesn't God appear with lightning and thunder to accompany his presence? The story of the Bible gives a full answer to this question. God did so appear at Sinai. God did so appear at the cross. God did so appear at the empty tomb. And he will so appear at the end. The reason he does not now appear is not that he is reluctant to, please unbelie- to persuade unbelievers. It's the opposite. He's giving them time to repent. You see, because when God next appears, when Jesus comes physically, the time of patience and the time of grace is over and the time of judgment begins. That's why Romans 2.4, such a great verse, says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? His forbearance is meant to lead you to repentance. Why is God not appearing at the moment? Because he's giving us time to repent. He's giving time for our loved ones and friends who don't know him to repent. He's giving us time to share the gospel with those who don't know it so they can repent. So we don't want to pervert God's patience, beloved, by presuming on it. It's not intended to be ignored. It's intended to lead to the action of repentance. Every messenger is one more sign of grace, but they don't go on forever. See? So they prostituted God's presence. They perverted God's patience. What else did they do? They profaned God's payment. God made payment, and they profaned it rather than accepting it. You know, here's the amazing truth about God, that sooner or later we have to get our arms around. We'll never love God until we get, until we get this. What God demands, which is a lot like perfection, right? What God demands, which is a lot, God supplies at huge cost. What God requires, God supplies. The only question is, will we accept his provision or will we continue to pervert it by being our own Owners. It's when we realize that God will provide what he requires, that we will fall in love with him. Pharisees never got that. So the owner of the vineyard says in verse 13, he says, well, what shall I do? And the obvious answer is take revenge, exact justice, but not this owner. He's not giving up on those rebellious tenants yet. So he says in verse 13, the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? Then I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. He's better than a servant. Now it's really getting close to me. I'll send my son. Surely they will respect him. 
But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let's kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. Now, Jesus doesn't explain why they thought they could get away with it. Perhaps they thought you know, the son's arrival signaled the death of the owner. It, it doesn't really matter whatever they continued to act like owners, apparently thinking they could get away with it. And they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. One final chance at redemption and they blew it. They killed the son. This, of course, is aimed squarely between the eyes of Israel's religious leaders. And they knew that. They knew that. Look at mid-verse 19. They perceived that he told this parable against them. They knew it. Why did they know it? Well, because they knew that their fathers had indeed killed all the prophets up till now, including John the Baptist. Yes, Herod Antipas was the one who actually killed John, but the Pharisees hated him and they stood by and were happy when the killing happened. But more than that, the son is now on the scene. And what are they doing? They're in the back rooms plotting his demise, even as Jesus speaks this parable. Those God-haters are planning to kill him. And they're going to succeed. He knows it. They know it. And so when he tells this parable, they know it's aimed at them. And they're squandering their last chance at redemption. You know, I came across, there's a, there's a scholar, he's a, middle, he's, a, he's a Christian scholar. Actually, he just died a couple months ago. Kenneth Bailey is his name, and he grew up in the Middle East, and so he, is, he was an expert, wrote several books on Mideast customs as they related to the Bible. But somewhere along the line, I picked up a story that he told one time about King Hussein of Jordan. King Hussein was informed one night in the early 1980s that there were about 75 plotters in the barracks of the soldiers who were plotting against him, and they were planning to take him over and to kill him and overthrow the government. But they had found that his intelligence, military intelligence, had found this out. And so they came to the king and they said, look, this is what's going on over here. We just need your permission and we'll wipe him out. And the king said to them, look, I had a different idea. He ordered a helicopter. He had the heli helicopter land him right on top of the flat roof of the barracks where, these <clears throat> where the plotters were. And then he said to the helicopter pilot, look, I'm going down and talk to these guys. He said, if I'm not back in a few minutes or if you hear guns flare, you take off. Don't you wait for me. And then he walked down right into the middle of these guys. And he said this. He said, gentlemen, I know that you are planning to take over and install a military dictator. If you do this, the army will break apart. You will never be able to hold all the factions together. The country will be plunged into civil war and thousands of innocent people will be killed. There's no need for this. Here I am. Kill me and proceed. That way, only one man will have to die. That's a pretty brave thing to do, don't you think? But what happened on that occasion is it paid off because the plotters and the rebels realized they were standing in the presence of a man they hadn't really known before. Every single one of them came forward before he left and pledged loyalty to him for life. His vulnerability and his courage saved the day. Which is exactly what did not happen for the Son of God. They were plotting to kill him and in and they managed to do that because he allowed them. Now, incredibly, it's really interesting because Caiaphas, the high priest, urged the same argument that King Hussein used, he used the same argument to stiffen the backs of those who were talking about killing Jesus. In John 11, verse 50, Caiaphas, the high priest, said to his plotters, he said, he said nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people not the whole nation should perish. He's against Jesus. He's trying to get him killed. And he says to these other guys who are getting a little bit weak in the knees, hey, look, it, it, don't, don't you understand? If we just kill this one guy, 
We'll save the whole nation. If we don't, we're going to have bloodshed everywhere. That was an interesting thing. Because what he did, of course, he just meant it to, to help put, you know, put steel in the spine of those who were trying to kill Jesus. But inadvertently, the Bible refers to this later, inadvertently he was making a prophecy that was true. It was one man who would die so that anybody who would believe could be saved, right? God uses really strange instruments sometimes, doesn't he? Because this is where amazing enters the picture. They killed him, all right. They killed Jesus. But they only killed him because he let them kill him. And in dying... He did what it tells us in Hebrews. He basically, he killed death and he made possible the forgiveness of every sin of everyone who would ever turn to him, including those who plotted against him. I like to think that a lot of the priests who are mentioned in the book of Acts as having come to faith in Christ later on after the resurrection of Christ were some of those who plotted against his life. I like to think that they were some of the Pharisees who plotted against his life, and I believe they were. Because they could be saved because he died. That's grace, beloved. And that's what Jesus came to do. Did it willingly. Said, I could have called 12 legions of angels to come and save me from this, and I didn't. So this parable highlights God's love in the face of Israel's hard-heartedness of their continued rebellion against him. He persisted and he persisted and he persisted. One prophet after another after another came on the scene to try and help them turn to God. Luther once said this, he said, if, if I were God and the world treated me as it treated him, I would kick the wretched thing to pieces. And if you know anything about Luther, he probably would have. That was his temperament, but it's not God's temperament. God eventually will exact justice, but God is a God of mercy, and so he sent his own son into the vineyard. He sent his own son with the hopes that they would turn because he loves his creation that much. He loves us that much. Spurgeon said this, I love how he said that. He's always so great with words. He says, if you reject him, he answers you with tears. If you wound him, he bleeds out cleansing. If you kill him, he dies to redeem. If you bury him, he rises again. Jesus is love made manifest. That's true, isn't it? Jesus is God's love played out in the life of a person like no other. In his, in his death, the Son paid for the very sin of rejecting him. Think about that. In his death, Jesus paid for the sin of killing him. For anybody who would believe. But listen, beloved, we cannot profane the payment by continued rejection. There has to be that moment when we turn from going this way of self to this way of him for the ownership of our life. Got to do that. Otherwise, we have absolutely profaned the payment that he has made on our behalf. The dead son is alive now. And here's what the Bible says. Here's what Jesus says himself in verse 16. He will come and destroy those tenants who give the vineyard to others. That was true of them and it's true of us. Those who reject Jesus will one day face his punishment. Those who insist on owning their own life will one day find out not only did they not own it, but they essentially condemn themselves. Don't insist on justice. You don't want justice. You do not want God's justice. You want God's mercy. And it's available. We don't want to profane his payment. Fourthly, God's preeminence is predestined. God's preeminence is predestined. What that basically means is God can't lose and you can't win. Okay? That's what it means. His preeminence is predestined. Caiaphas couldn't win and God can't lose. That's the point of Jesus' final comment. He looked at them directly and said, what 
then is this? This is in verse 17. He looked at them directly and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken in pieces. When it falls on anyone, it will crush him. His simple message is this. Listen, I'm the son of God. And guess what? I am God's chosen cornerstone. I'm the center of everything. In rejecting me, you are rejecting the center of God's plan. You're putting me aside as though I were a cornerstone that didn't matter, as though you have something better to put in my place. And you can reject me now. But the day will come when you will be crushed on me. Jesus either saves or he crushes. It's one or the other. Because it has to be that way. But here's the, here's the important thing, beloved. He was crushed so you don't have to be. He was crushed so your loved ones don't have to be. He was crushed so your friends and relatives don't have to be. Do we love them enough to share the gospel with them and at least give them a chance to know this? The cornerstone that men reject, God has already predestined to be the one who is the center of everything. Jesus is basically saying here, listen, my preeminence is a foregone conclusion. Your short-term gain will be your long-term condemnation. Don't go there. Let me summarize this parable in five little propositions. Number one, God has given us a life and we are to live it for him. God has given us a life and we are to live it for him. Number two, instead, we begin to act like owners. I did it my way. I will do it my way. I'm determined to do it my way. I have the right to do it my way. All of those are statements of rebellion against the ownership of God. Number three, God sends messengers to remind us that we are not owners, but we reject them with increasing violence. This is the danger of sitting in a service like this and rejecting one more time, because the rejection becomes more violent every time. The possibility of repentance comes a little less every time. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but its likelihood is very much less. Just like with these men. Number four, God sends his own son, but we kill him in the end because it's either him or us, and we all did. All of our sins put him on the cross, so we were there just as much as these people were, helping put him on the cross, but his very being crushed could be being crushed for us if we accept him. That's point five, God extends mercy to all who ask, others will be broken on the stone of justice. It's our choice. It's your choice. So who will it be, him or you? Who owns you? When I think of this, it always causes me to think of Lord Byron. You know, he was the notorious English poet, Where's Amy? I think I saw her today. She could tell you a lot more about Lord Byron than I can. But I can tell you this. He was a very dissolute man. He was a man who prided himself of living life to the full, of experiencing everything that he could ever possibly experience. His, his, his love affairs were scandalous even in his own time, including one with his half-sister, he was an infidel to the end. But on his deathbed at the age of 36, not very old, the gospel was shared with him one more time, and he heard it, and he listened. But then he exclaimed, shall I sue for mercy, knowing that he was going to die? Shall I sue for mercy? And then he said, come, come, no weakness. Let, let us be a man to the last. And as best anyone knows from a human perspective, that's exactly what he did. Maintaining an ownership that was not really his right till the end. Until it condemned him. And one minute after he was in eternity, he knew the trade had been a bad trade. He traded mercy for justice. He had no idea what he was missing out on. Ownership comes at a high price. One way or the other. Jesus paid a high price 
to take ownership of your life, you will pay a much higher price than you can ever imagine if you insist on maintaining an ownership that's not really yours in the first place. So what will it be? C.S. Lewis said it best. He said there are two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Please be one of those who says, I believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and I accept him as my Savior, as my Lord, as my Master, as my owner. And now that I have him, I want to pray for others and I want to make sure that they know of this possibility as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the for the message, it really couldn't be more clear than it is in this parable. You, Jesus, were God's chosen instrument, God in the flesh, to be the chief cornerstone of the whole edifice of redemption. When we Refuse your ownership, your lordship in our life. We are putting that cornerstone aside as though it didn't matter. But of course, if God really sent Jesus, then it matters eternally. And the day will come when we are faced with that reality. Father, let it be now. If there's anyone here that is here, let me put it differently. Those who are here that don't know you today, because there always are some. Would you please open their hearts, cause them to respond in faith right now to you, to open their heart and to say, I acknowledge my sin, I acknowledge my rebellion, I acknowledge my selfishness, I renounce it all right now in favor of the forgiveness that Jesus offers and allowing him to become Lord of my life. You would come in right now if they would do that. For some of us, Father, it's more a matter of praying and having a true compassionate heart for those who will one day be crushed on this cornerstone if we don't share the gospel with them. So please give us a compassionate heart, a heart that matches yours. Pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.